Growing and scaling a business is complex. It can be very scary and lonely trying to navigate it all. It comes down to the community of trusted people you surround yourself with. Let's dive in to the Business is People podcast. Welcome, gentlemen. Excited to talk about today's topic that's relevant that we've been hearing for years, and it's going to be much more so moving forward. We got Ken Sheehan here, who is our data scientist guru, and Aaron Abbott, who is our lead growth strategist. And we've had a lot of these conversations offline with our clients, but I wanted to share this with the world today to what it's going to look like you know, next year and tomorrow going into the privacy laws, understand the cookie list world, and just really understanding what does data mean for businesses and how they should leverage the data that they have or don't have to make better business decisions. Because I think a lot of people just don't know what to do with their data. All right. So Ken, we're in a cohort with some really intellectual people who are making big impacts in the industry in, with a Fortune 100 company. And they're responsible for understanding the data. And of course, that data ripple affects big decisions when it comes to funding and VCs and scaling and buying and hiring and firing. So why don't you give us a little bit of insight on what is the culture and what is the current situation today when it comes around data? Sure. I mean, that's a big ask, um, but (laughs) we'll jump right in. One thing I will say is that you know, that cookie list world is coming down the pike and is already here in some respects. You know, there have been little changes that have been rolling out through Apple and sort of other feelers that Google has been putting out. And what we know is that even the biggest companies, Fortune 100, Fortune, you know, wherever you want to go, they are struggling with how to deal with that issue. And so that really puts it into play for what does it mean for the rest of us that don't have those incredibly deep pockets to hire you know, a huge team of data scientists and PhDs to solve those data problems. And so the state of the industry is simply that we're looking to respond to and figure out solutions to the ongoing changes, which as we all know, things have changed dramatically even from five and 10 years ago. And so we're now shifting the paradigm again. So some agencies haven't even caught up to where we are and we're now moving to a new place. And so I think that puts it sort of in perspective that we're all dealing with the same issues and it's going to impact everybody, small company, large company, mid-sized company. Secondarily is, is that it's all going to be solved by how we utilize data. So the data that's available to us already is not being leveraged appropriately. And I think that's something we could talk to. And then there are data sources that are going to need to be either created or curated to help us solve these problems. And I know that Aaron, our other guru that's on the call, deals with a lot of that infrastructure and could easily give some input into that. If you, if yeah, you Aaron, uh, if you don't mind, because Ken alluded to issues, right? And then people listening, you're like, well, what are these issues? Because sometimes people don't know that they actually have issues. So yeah. just to kind of like paint that picture, or set that plot, like what are the common issues that you're hearing as we're chatting with other businesses? Well, I think if you're utilizing a third-party tracker, so if you got Google Analytics, say, you know, you're putting a, a snippet on your website to track, that in itself can be inaccurate from the get-go. It's really an accuracy problem and then figuring out where to leverage it and how to leverage it. So it's kind of a conundrum of existing, even existing privacy laws. What are you allowed to use? What are you allowed to leverage through other systems kind of thing? And then how are teams able to get to that data mine that data and and then consume that data to make decisions that are accurate. You know, you pointed out earlier when we were talking about the gentleman that said that spreadsheets are inaccurate. Yeah, spreadsheets definitely inaccurate because you have that human touch. I mean, I've done that with SEO reports where I was pulling out rankings and I copied and pasted one cell down. So all the rankings were off. I did my whole analysis on it. And then when we're talking, like, wait, that doesn't make sense. And I was like, oh, wow, that was a human mistake. You know, same thing with data. Like if we don't, in the systems, so if we don't tag things appropriately, we could send different variables to different out, you know, inputs or outputs and then be crunching things and get completely erroneous conclusions out of that. So I think that's what's exciting about it. That it's scary because, you know, what, Ken, what you mentioned, you know, people having gotten caught up to now, you know, and we're already looking five years ahead. And it's, it's like with the computer, we're, we're happy if we can get five years out of our computer, you know, with the way business models and technology are evolving. I mean, we've kind of got like a maybe a six month to a one year lifespan before we're actually 
seeing a new kind of a, a paradigm shift begin in things. So getting into today, looking at where we're going with data, it's, it's an opportunity for a lot of businesses, once you understand what's going on, to sit back, kind of reassess and move things around to where we set up the infrastructure for all of our teams to be able to function and set expectations, you know, set the SLAs. But really for the long term of it, it's making sure that we have an accurate infrastructure so we can make those informed decisions that are going to allow us, you know, to the future, like what Ken does with his genius of the predictive modeling stuff. Like if we take the time on my side of the fence to set up the data accurately, you know, including like a customer data platform. So we're putting it all into a data warehouse, let's say, then Ken can go in there and he has an accurate place to pull all that data out, to apply all of his models and to really go beyond decisions and go into like his little genie realm. <laughs> so, yeah. I think if I may, before you jump in, Tom, is that a critical point there, one is garbage in, garbage out, right? Every person that's dealt with data has probably heard that term. And it, it's really true in this case. We want to make sure that we're getting, putting accurate information into the system so that we can pull accurate information out. That's a key point, whether it is you're looking at marketing data, you're looking at sales data, any decision you're making, it has to be based off of good information. And I think a really critical point here is that most companies, many companies, particularly in that small to medium size category, are not utilizing their own data to great effect at all. In many cases, they're not even collecting it effectively. So that will be one of the big, I think, key point paradigm shifts is that companies are going to have to start accessing and utilizing their data more effectively and leveraging that to kind of circumvent or go around and work in that cookie world, right? So the onus is now going to be on the company. If you can't rely on Google to get into, you know, an individual's kind of computer and email and serve an ad based on the cookie system, if you remove that capability, you are then going to have to know yourself what to do as an individual company. And that means that the onus is on that company to control their own data. And so that's really where we step in actually, Tom, is that we're looking at leveraging the company's own data to new and greater effect. And then that actually kind of matriculates out into decisions, not just for marketing, but even management decisions, right? The interaction between sales and marketing as well, right? You can start looking at the company as a business ecosystem and it's a phrase that I've recently taken to using in this type of discussion, which is I'm modeling the business ecosystem. And that's the way we need to start approaching this. It's not just marketing. It's not just one thing or the other. It's looking at that business ecosystem as a whole and leveraging data types across the overall business ecosystem platform to make better decisions and understand the business better, including marketing and advertising. And that's the evolution that we're seeing as an agency. We've always evolved, you know, marketing's evolved, sales has evolved, especially now with, you know, seeing the pandemic, people buying habits, what they're open to and doing things virtually. So there's so many elements between just black and white data, but there's also intangibles, you know, there's the human side of it, there's the psychology side of it. What we're educating our clients all the time is that you have to understand what are the success metrics, these KPIs that matter to you. That's trackable, but what's scary for those that are aware, it's, we mentioned with the privacy laws, the cookie list and the attributions that's going to be missing that we're going to see next year. So how can marketing firms like us, you know, knowing that we're going to lose things like that, but not just even just us as marketing firms, just like, you know, I feel like we're, we're business consultants say, okay, we're not going to get this data now from these third-party platforms. Where can we make up that gap? Where can we control, to your point, can control and gather the right data points so that we can maintain clear information so leadership can make the right decisions on their business as they're scaling and growing? Because data is not just about marketing and sales. It's also for HR, it's for hiring, it's for operations, finance. We're seeing the information, the reporting, the analytics that we're providing impacts multiple cross departments. Aaron, you know, could you kind of maybe painting a picture of what that looks like? Because when we're coming in and we're helping business really understand clean data, mm -hmm. how do that impact all the departments? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not just the departments you're impacting. It's the ultimate, it's, it's an evolution in the customer experience too. Because like you mentioned, you know, we're losing the ability to leverage that data. We're not really losing the ability to leverage the data because I mean, 
Think about programmatic advertising. That's a huge industry. That's not going anywhere. It's relying right now on a third-party pixel. Tracking code, we got to add that in so they can do the thing. There's ways to get around that. You know, it's like with a huge email provider, I don't want to call it brands, but I was in a cohort on that. And they talked about how with the new Apple release, when they're opening the emails and stuff, they've already figured out how they can leverage webhooks to kind of circumvent and show opens and stuff like that. So it's a reworking of your infrastructure in a big scale. But at the same time, reworking that infrastructure is giving you a chance to kind of come back and set it up in a proper way so everybody can communicate better. And that data will not just help align teams to make decisions, but it's going to allow us, because you have that first party data accumulating now, we'll be able to really create, you know, there's a confusion a lot of people have between multi-channel and omni-channel. Multi-channel marketing will say, when you do one thing, you know, you want to coordinate it between all the channels, but it's not in real time across channels. Omnichannel is like when I have a customer and they do something on their phone, it shows up on the desktop, it shows up in the database all at the same time. So that's where these new standards are kind of an opportunity in shaping a better experience to move forward. And it's kind of a shame that we didn't look at it from this, you know, from the beginning like this when the interweb was born, <laughs> you know, so it's. I think a great question would be relative to what Aaron was just saying is the cookie world is coming. So what really does that look like? And I think in my view, it's opportunity. I really don't mind that the entire current paradigm goes away, right? Because we're going to find a solution to that. And to me, that's just a way to get creative and figure out a path around that, that we can then adhere to whatever the current laws are and do it in a way that personally I prefer. Like, I don't like things following me around so much. I think it would be wonderful to know that I can be delivered an ad or a service and that can be done in an appropriate manner without it really kind of raising people's hackles, right? And so I welcome that challenge and, and we already have made some pretty great gains at that already with the work we've been doing at InThink. Aaron, I want to back up a little bit. Right now, email marketers or marketing directors who are managing email campaigns, they see the open rates versus, you know, click rates and stuff like that versus now, like, Will those open rates numbers be a lot different? Because I think you mentioned before that maybe if you have an iOS device, everything just opens. So now yeah. that there's inflation in yeah. the data and it might look like, oh, wow, we're crushing it. But that's not the case at all because it's yeah. just how the system is now, you know, sending the data. So can you just explain that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's more of just understanding the changes so you can react to the data and make note of that stuff as the systems that we're relying upon evolve so we can get that accurate tracking back in play. So it's almost like you got to keep a little side note, like on these months, we're seeing inflated opens. So that way we're not, you know, say, hey, we had a great month in email opens and everybody's happy when there really wasn't that happening, you know? So it's, it's more understanding your tools, I think, is going to be the biggest factor of success. And, you know, I mean, looking at marketing technology as a whole beyond email system, well, just look at email systems. You've got MailChimp, Constant Contact, HubSpot, SendGrid. There's tons of resources out there. So people are like, well, this one's better. This one's better. Yeah, this, at the end of the day, it's just which one ever your personality really aligns with the best. They're all going to do the same thing. And we see that time and time again when we go through systems and we're figuring out how to set up reporting based on their MarTech stack. Where are we pulling that data from? And that goes back to the beginning of the discussion. What data points are we talking about? And then how are we ensuring that it's an accurate data so we can make that decision? And so just understanding the landscape of the changes that are happening right now. And I think just communicating with your support teams, because the email provider I mentioned about the Apple stuff, they had a, a conference about here's what's going on right now. And here's what we're doing to fix that. And here's what you can plan on seeing in the next year. So that way you can plan that in place and you know that that data is going to be there. And, you know, in that light, so to say, so. I want to throw a little curveball into the conversation and sort of ask the question of many of the clients that we deal with every day, they pay enormous sums of money for programs like HubSpot, Salesforce. I mean, there's an extensive list of those. And one of the things data-wise, Aaron, that you and I have actually spoken about separately is that the ability of those platforms to communicate and to provide data in a uniform manner that we can analyze is often well beyond the capabilities that are 
provided and really an opportunity to provide much better understanding. And so sometimes the sales team will focus on Salesforce and then mm -hmm. the marketing team fo focuses on Google Analytics or whatever their source of truth is. And there is some attempt to make those speak or integrate those or get data coming through, but the amount of problems and the ability to then get usable information out of that is very under leveraged, even though technically any of those programs would say that they have that capability. So mm -hmm. I'm curious what you think about that and come as well. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody's gonna say we can do it all, but I mean, the minute you recognize that we can't do it all and we work better together, I think that should be kind of a mantra for marketing moving forward, for sales, for companies moving forward. You know, I mean, if you think about Salesforce and HubSpot, you know, you got a sales team and Salesforce, a marketing team and HubSpot, there goes that SLA. And, and back in the day, HubSpot used to make you sign an SLA between your sales team and your marketing team. That was part of their process. I think that they kind of let that part of it go, but there was an alignment going between the team's expectation. Like the salespeople knew that the lead coming in, the MQL or the SQL, whenever they had that push over, they were secure knowing that this is the information that we need. This is an accurate lead. This is a hot lead. This isn't just some, you know, tire kicker kind of thing. So it's really, yeah, choosing the right KPIs and allowing the systems to talk together, but at the same time, realize that those systems are going to have redundancies. And so that's what we're talking about too, Ken, is how do we get all that data unified into one place, put into a warehouse. And that way, if you've got sessions in Salesforce and sessions in HubSpot, but, but all those sessions are being tracked from website pages. And then you got website page views like, okay, well, all right, so take the time to put the nomenclature in place, label them, and then put them into a warehouse. And that way, everything's going downstream into a big old pool that we can go in and swim in at any time we want to. So it's just that coordination and that's going to really, I think, set apart everything, even nowadays. I mean, if you take that step, even if privacy changes weren't going to you know, change over the next years, you know, taking this step now is a fundamental difference between future success and, and no success. I mean, the emerging companies, I said it earlier, customer experience, that's the difference between a huge company that you love and their competitors that you don't love. I mean, let's go back to Facebook versus MySpace back in the day, you know, and it's like, sorry, Tom, but people got onto Facebook because Facebook, they kind of got that social monetization. They made you get invited by a friend. You know what I mean? You couldn't just go create your account. So there was this experience that they created that made you want it. And that's the stuff that we're going to be able to do with data nowadays, because it's not that data is going to be blocked. It's going to be how you can leverage the data that you collect that's changing. So, you know, we can't just go out and say, okay, let me get a big old list of third-party pixel-based IPs and cookies. No, that stuff's going to go in. We can collect all that and then push that to a system so we can still do our remarketing in LinkedIn or Google or in a programmatic effect, you know, so all that's there, but it's just the how. And then I think, you know, just that connector, it's setting that foundation, putting up your wireframes or, you know, if you're in film, putting your storyboard together to make sure it's all laid out properly. It's yeah, and I, I think um, one of the key points of all this that Aaron mentioned multiple times just there is the word future, right? Everything is future looking. How are we going to handle data in the future? How are we going to leverage it? But one thing that we haven't really touched on is something that almost nobody is doing, at least in agencies that I've been experienced with or that I'm hearing down the pike, except that the very seldom at the very highest levels, and that is predictive modeling. So we have new tools at our fingertips. We have machine learning. We have ability to actually take data, if it's collected right, as Aaron just mentioned, and do a prediction. Let's just talk sessions, right? We could actually, if we knew what was coming down the pike in terms of sessions, we could then make predictions on many other channels associated with that, including sales. And then we can validate that with actual sales that come in, so attribution becomes even more important than it's ever been in this case and linking those data systems up like Aaron mentioned. So I, I think the future is predicting the future, meaning that a, a strong agency needs to jump into that world. I see a smile, Kyle. I'm curious what you're thinking. Because folks who are listening, right, are probably saying, BS can, you can't predict the future. I've been trying to get this for years. Everyone is, you know, telling me this is doable. I've worked with so many analysts and consultants and agencies, they've all failed. So how do we cut to the chase and kind of like 
you know, clear the air here of like, what does predictive modeling mean? And uh, we can only speak to how we do it and how we help our clients, right? And, and sometimes it's hard to know the difference between a good one and, and a bad one, but let's educate people a little bit here. Like, what does that mean? What is predictive modeling and how, how are we ensuring that it works? And what's the margin of error? Sure. So big picture, you start with good data, as Aaron has been mentioning this discussion. Secondary to getting good data in is what you then do with that data. So in terms of looking at a predicting different aspects of that business ecosystem that we're looking at, what we want to do is vet that, meaning if we create a model, which we can do, that then pre predicts out, for instance, a week or two weeks or even six months or a year, we want to understand how reactive and accurate that model is over time. So if, for instance, you're projecting out six months, we want to actually benchmark that as the model moves forward. The model also has to be dynamic and reactive. It can't be static, right? Because the world is not static. In that way, data becomes even more important. So you need to feed data in continuously so that you can adjust the model moving forward. So as with anything, we want to statistically bound that prediction. So we want to understand that this is our prediction, but here are the bounds of where it may perform based on variation within that system. So the better our data and the better our ability to understand each of those bits of data coming in, we can tighten the statistical bounds which each of those channels are working on so that the predictive aggregate actually is able to, for instance, if a marketing director would come to me and say, our sales group wants to know a projection of what our potential of high quality leads are, if that's what you're predicting. And so they want to know that the number that they're being given is it doesn't have to be exact or perfect, right? And we're not saying that prediction is perfect result. What prediction is, is understanding an appropriate result and understanding why it may vary from that. So sometimes we can actually get very good results. So I, I recently did a model com that it's been running now for about six months for a client, it's national. And we're running at about 97.5% accuracy over the course of that model. So it, in one week, for instance, if... 102 units are sold rather than 100. Does that matter for making a decision in the sales team or how we're making an overall understanding of what's going on? Absolutely not. It also gives an understanding of revenue that you can make decisions off of or whether a sale worked. We can understand whether a model's reacting well to the sale, you know, kind of fluctuations or market fluctuations. So prediction is a, a slippery slope, right? The goal is to understand the prediction and make it usable. We can do that, no problem. How accurate we can get with that, that's still being decided, but it's functional and usable right now as we do it within thing. What we've seen across the board is usually, you know, within 5%, because it's not as large of an inaccuracy number. So we're within a really reasonable threshold of 5%, give or take. And it comes down to the great work that you guys are doing when you're gathering the right data, the clean data, and then building it the right way. Um, and an analogy I use all the time, I think people can relate to this, is ingredients, right? So everyone has all, like if you're cooking, People have access to similar ingredients, salt, pepper, you know, garlic powder. It comes down to the chef, right? When you're looking at data and building, it comes down to the analysts, you know, the gurus, the experts like yourself, and how they utilize, you know, those ingredients to make that perfect dish. But then also tweaking the ingredients to align with that person's palate or the goal of the person who's looking to have your dish. So again, understanding you know, our clients and what they're trying to achieve, what, what success means to them so that we can give them the right data. You don't want to just work with someone that says, here's our approach and here you go. And they're not taking the time to customize the data and the process and the systems and how they gather it to align with your business goals. So that's critical. When we talked about predictive modeling, this is really exciting for us when we started to roll this out was helping businesses now feel reassured when they're going to market with a new product or going to a new market with their existing product, predicting like, what is the potential revenue? What's the potential opportunity for us to win in this geography or win with this new product launch? Another scenario is we need to make a million dollars off of this. Is that doable? Can we do that? Because the hard thing for a lot of marketing okay. agencies is like, they can't say with confidence, yeah, we can help you hit that revenue goal. I think a lot of people will say we will try. That's what we're doing. But not only for us, what we can say is like, 
oh, we know within a certain percent error rate, which is, you know, right now we're looking at like a 5% threshold. Yeah, we're pretty confident we can get you to that XYZ revenue goal or XYZ market penetration or product launch success because of this model that we're able to build. Can you give us any anecdotes there, Ken, of like example scenarios without having disclosed, you know, a certain business name? So what type of example would you like me to give? I can. I, certainly I think revenue can. goals, anyone within a leadership team, like everyone's usually pretty much aligned to a revenue goal. So like most businesses sure. are trying to figure out when they're putting the plan together, yeah. hey, we need to be X amount of growth this year. If it's 30% or going from 50 million to maybe 60 million. And then how do we put a plan to reach that goal and work backwards? It comes so down to data and modeling. You're really talking about appropriately scoping and setting expectations. So sales will often say, or you may be the, the new investor group that's come in, whatever situation, and they will have very aggressive goals. And that goal may be a million dollars in sales by XD, right? And so in order to appropriately reach that goal, you have to back calculate and see if it's even possible under the current spend, under what's going on. And so if, for instance, you can give the decision makers the ability to know that under the current spend, under the current efforts that are being made, there's no way that you are going to reach that million dollar goal. That means that they then have a decision to make. And that's fine if you want to still keep that goal there. Just be aware that it is pie in the sky and it's not realistic. And that allows a marketing agency, a marketing department, it allows the sales team to understand more realistically what the you know, high performance, median performance, and maybe high in the sky performance would be, right? So I think that puts it into frame a little bit. Oftentimes, this question is to both of you guys, but more so up Aaron, because you're the one usually building these strategies is people jump right into paid advertising, right? Mm -hmm. So like, okay, I, I want organic, that takes time, inbound, that takes time. No, we think there's two types of programs we run parallel. So you, you always need to build that demand generation, that organic, you know, brand affinity building inbound leads. But then if you want to amplify it quickly, but also have those very specific nuances of controlling the targeting of your mm -hmm. audience and, and geography, that's paid advertising. So mm -hmm. can you speak to that a little bit, Aaron, where some people are doing it right and wrong, but then like they also looking at their data yeah. right and wrong, right? To, to, to yeah. grow revenue. Well, I mean, let's look at it for Google ads. Let's use keyword matches as an example. You can set an exact match or you can use a broad match. You know, the broad match is going to say, if you got tennis, then anything related to tennis will show up. But if you put exact match tennis ball, somebody has to search exactly for tennis ball, you know, and that's the only way that ad's going to show up. I think that's kind of where we're looking right now is without data, everything is a broad match guess. Like we're just going after everything. With the accurate data, we can pinpoint and adjust. And a great example is like, well, Ken and I will do is coordinate when once we have enough data, we can look back to see where things perform within an account and then we can model moving forward. So like, say, you know, over time and space, you know, if sales and one zip code, you know, we can look at neighborhoods, you know what I mean? Neighboring neighborhoods <laughs> that we have the zip code here, sales happen on Monday here, but then they happen on Wednesday over here. Why do we have ads running on Wednesday over here? Let's have all the ads running here and here on Monday and Wednesday appropriately. You know what I mean? So it's that refinement. It's that ability to adjust in real time, if not faster than real time in a way, because we're getting into the predictive realm of it. And we know if we spend the money here, then we're going to hit these numbers and we're good to go kind of thing, you know? A great example of that, which I found last week specifically for a client, is we were able to identify the threshold of spend and exposure that elevated performance from one or two conversions under a given dollar spent to three or four conversions. And that was based on certain structure of the exposure and spend and how it was being received by Google. And so we can look at that and, and we can actually, for every single client in the PPC world, look at where that threshold occurs and set our goals accordingly internally and say, look, we need to push exposure in this zip code to a certain level, otherwise we're going to get a lower result here. And if we push it to a certain level effectively, we'll be in the upper result here. And we can definitively show that. And I, I just dropped that on you, but that's something that we can do that I just had a great example from a client last week. I'm sure we'll talk about that after this podcast. But. And, and that to your point, Ken, it's like we're constantly ensuring that we're doing the best to represent our clients and educate people on the ever-changing world of what's happening with data. 
you know, and how to leverage it right way so that you're, to your point, you went from one to two conversions to three to four, 100% improvement. I mean, that's crazy. Like people are ecstatic about 10, 15, 100% improvement. I'm sure the cost for acquisition went down too, because like, I think a lot of people go into these programs spending, mm-hmm. let's say on Google ads, they could be spending 10,000 a month and they're like, oh, we get 3% conversion. That's pretty much our max, yeah. but it's their max because they didn't know which levers to adjust to then say, well, actually we might look at it and be like 3%. We could probably get that to five, 10, 20 with the right data points at the same spend or even less spend. Cause it, it's not so, so much about total spend for us. It's like, we want to look at the conversions, the, the really the total sales. So we're really helping our clients to leverage every single dollar and uh, lower that cost per acquisition. If it's 1800, hopefully down to maybe seven, we've had some scenarios we've gone down to 700 from 1800 to 700 cost per acquisition. Mitigate risk, become more efficient at generating leads or conversions or whatever you're going for. And that's really the name of the game. So yeah, I mean, Anything improved over the baseline or even good performance, incremental changes in the upward direction, that's what we're seeking to do. And inches over time add up to quite a lot. I mean, that's, you know, the age old lesson. All right, guys, we're actually wrapping up here. So we have a lot more times when we get together here for meeting of the minds, but any last nuggets of uh, wisdom? Pay attention to what's going on and prepare. (laughs) Oh, you know, to that point, Aaron, I actually wanted to ask this earlier was, most people, they don't have folks like you, right, on their team. So what are their options? Let's, let's end it with that. What are their options? Aaron at InThinkAgency.com. <laughs> <laughs> We're always here to help, of course. But, you know, it, I mean, it, the, real, the reality of the scenario is right now, right, they don't have these types of people within their team. So, like, what, what can they do? Reach out to their vendors, you know, whoever their tool is, that their, you know, their tech stack. What's the tool you're going to logging in on a daily basis and going and pulling data out to make decisions? Call them up, call your support team and say, what's going on? What do I need to be aware of? You know, I've done that with all the tools that we use. What are you guys doing to prepare for this in the next two years? And I get a layout and I understand, okay, cool. You know, I mean, that you just got to do your diligence. You know, you got to spend the time and learn. And that's one thing that a lot of people don't do is spend that time to read the manual, read the manual, so to say, you know what I mean? Um, I think my last thing would be that if you're not paying attention to your own data, and often we forget to pay attention to our own data because we're busy running things and doing our daily due diligence, if you're not getting control of your data within your company, you're going to be missing out on growth potential and opportunity that's about to drop in your lap. And so pay attention to that. And I think that's where I would leave it. Because the train has left the station. There are businesses who already saw the writing on the wall over, you know, a year or two ago, and they already are implementing and making changes. It doesn't happen overnight. So it's a mindset with leadership teams and departments, but it's also, you know, the investment that needs to be done and infrastructure and process and systems to be done to say, this is what the norm is going to be moving forward. Businesses have changed no matter if you're SMB all the way up to enterprise. So please make sure that you're doing the due diligence to do what's best for your business. And at the end of the day, you're going to save money in the long run and make higher impacts, revenues, margins, and profitability by looking at the right data. Yep. All right. Well, everything will be in the show notes. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. We're here for you. Go out there and make it happen. If you have any questions and topics you'd like us to cover, please email me at podcast at or message me on LinkedIn.